Welcome to the Ladies Who Leverage podcast, where we empower women to connect authentically, build strategically, and live life unapologetically AF. It's time for women to embrace that they are powerful at their core and to leverage their expertise, resources, and relationships to build their business, their brand, and their badassery. I'm your host, Kelly Charles Collins, and we invite you to subscribe to the Ladies Who Leverage podcast. Our episodes drop every Monday at 9 a.m. Eastern. So listen, enjoy, share, and subscribe. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Ladies Who Leverage podcast. Today, we have another special guest. And yes, everyone who comes on the Ladies Who Leverage podcast is special. So I want you to make sure that you are listening today because today is really interesting. I think um, you'll probably wonder like, well, why is Kelly speaking to Dawn? But this, when I, when I got information about Dawn, I was like, I have to have her on the podcast. So let me give you a little bit of a background and then you'll see where we're going today and how important somebody like Dawn is in our community, just in the world. And maybe it'll give you some ideas about what you can do. So after living, after 10 years of living in China and visiting orphanages full of little girls that taught her about the horrors of trafficking. After getting to know the children and the teens that had been victims of human trafficking. And so something came to Dawn about what she could do, right? How could she make an impact for these little girls? And so Dawn Mansky has a dream to help rescue and restore trafficked people started with a pair of pants. And I can't wait for her to tell you that story because this, this is remarkable. Again, just how much we can use our own talents and gifts to make an impact in the world. And so Dawn said, if there is any way I can help girls like this by selling pants, I will sell pants. So her increase, this increased her understanding of using solid ethical business practices to create systemic social change. So Don, welcome to the Ladies Who Leverage podcast. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you so much. It is wonderful to be here. So we're talking about pants and we're talking about human trafficking <laughs> and we're talking about little girls and we're going to get to all of that. But before we do that, give our audience just a little bit about your background and how we come to the point where we're talking about pants and human trafficking. You know, it's a, it, it's kind of this wind around little thing. I have a couple degrees in education. I was a teacher for a while. I have a degree in theology. Um, notice the lack of business education there. <laughs> and But I think the thread that ties them all together is I really love helping people. I, when I see, when I see an injustice, when I see a need, when I see something that is just not right, I'm, I can be very passionate. A friend of mine uh, gave me this little title, champion of causes. And, you know, and I think that that is pretty much the red thread that runs through my life and that I, I, I want to love people well. And when they are in hard places, I, I, want, to, I want to step into that. So I think that's kind of, that, that's kind of a quick overview. Yeah. Well, it just seems that that's just something that's in you, right? To, to do, do well and do good. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, education, most people don't go into education for money, right? Nope. No, education. you don't. <laughs> Mostly, most people leave education for money. <laughs> right, right. So in your background, it's it's almost natural that we've come to this, this space. But, you know, in the beginning, I said that you were in China for 10 years. So how did you get, how did you end up being in China? You know, I, when I was in college, I saw demonstrations online, not online. What am I thinking? No, nope. when I was in college, it wasn't online. <laughs> online. <laughs> It was on TV and I, I was watching these reports of like there's thousands of college students demonstrating and just passionately pursuing freedom and things that they didn't have. And, and I just, I started thinking about these people and I'm like, they live in a completely different land. This was China, but 
we're college students, so we probably have a lot in common. So we have similarities, but obviously live in completely different countries, very different cultures. So a lot of differences as well. And I started praying for these students. I didn't know who they were. And, and I felt like God wanted me to go to China. So that's really kind of it. You know, I saw, I saw this need and I thought, what can I do? And, um, and I just, I felt God calling me to go to China. My mom was like, what? (laughs) And, you know, but she had known me all my life and this wasn't too much of a surprise, not necessarily easy for her. But after that summer, I went, I wasn't done with college yet. I went for a summer, but I started studying Chinese at college. I, I was horrible. Okay. To be completely honest, my, my professor, I talked him into a B in my class. Oh, was it a C? No, I think I talked him into a C and he said, I will give you the C if you promise never to take Chinese again. It was, <laughs> I was that bad. Oh, wow. Dog. But I started taking Chinese and I looked for some sort of program that I could go the next summer to China. And I studied Chinese again, little to his, or much to his dismay. Um, and ended up after I graduated, finding a job where I was a teacher in China. And so I taught for several years and ended up, I mean, I thought I was going for one year, but ended up there 10 years. And wow. that's where, you know, I was, I was there for all sorts of reasons. I, that's where God called me. And so that's where I was. And I started, he started showing me these different areas of need that weren't just in China, but global issues, you know, devaluation of the girl child, extreme poverty and the vulnerability that people experience because of that poverty, uh, marginalization. So yeah, it was, it was 10 incredible years and, and I ended up there. God called me. I, there is not really. (laughs) Yeah, no, I, I understand that. I mean, you know, we do have calling right? On Mm -hmm. our life. And when you follow that calling, it really does keep you aligned to your true self, Mm. right? And so when you were there, what was it that caused you to start visiting like the orphanages? And what was that like? It was a friend of mine who had been, that was the first city I lived in. And he this was a regular thing. And he rallied the foreign community. He's like, come on, we got to get out of bed at 6 a.m. on a Saturday and we got to go and hang out with these little orphans because they don't have anyone to just hold them. They're tied in chairs all week. And, you know, so we, he, he was quite the initiator, instigator, all of these, those things, but incredibly passionate and loved these kids and called those of us that were in the same city to to work with him to do this and the number of little girls just blew my mind and I thought what in the world I mean this is a this is a society where the boys were cherished so much that when someone had a little girl they would just put her up for adoption well put her up for adoption no that's not what happened they just abandoned her you know so little girls were abandoned on a regular basis or aborted or killed You know, so that the numbers of girls that were in these little, these orphanages was just appalling. And, you know, and then later I moved to a couple other cities. So I ended up living in Beijing for about eight years and I met someone, this young lady came to Beijing and she said, I came here to help street children. And I was like, okay, I don't know what you're talking about, but she, I knew of several kids, lots of kids, certain areas of town, these young kids would hang out and beg for money or beg for food, or they would come and wash windows. You know, they'd wash your windows without asking and then ask for money, or they would try to sell flowers or something like that. And those were the street kids. And she started explaining to me these kids came from very poor parts of China and there was someone who would convince their family that if they came to the big city, 
they would make a lot of money and there were lots of opportunities and we, you know, your, your son, your daughter is going to have a much better life and they're going to, you know, when you're extremely poor and you can barely afford food, having enough money just to buy food is huge, you know, yeah. much less all these great opportunities that they were promising. So these kids were taken to the big city, but it was labor trafficking. And that wasn't the terminology we were using at the time. But, you know, my friend explained to me how the how this whole process was working. I got to know the kids. The kids, you know, I would go and celebrate holidays with them. They would come over to my place. You know, I ended up with great relationships with these kids because she ended up starting a school, pulling them out of that situation. Okay. So that was those were some of the big things I learned while living in China. Yeah. It was after I came back to the United States, um, I was at grad school and I, I went to like this informational luncheon hosted by IJM, International Justice Mission. And they had an undercover reporter that went in to the back alleys of Cambodia asking for the youngest girls he could find. Wow. And it just ripped my heart out. And I was like, you know, and having a better, having seen the vulnerability that is caused by poverty and devaluation of the girl child, there are lots of vulnerabilities, but those are two that are hugely significant in this realm. And they, he went back there and you see on this video, they bring in seven or eight girls you know, ranging from maybe seven years old to 13, I don't know. And, and they're like, okay, which one do you want? And I just, it was so hard to watch. And I thought, how is it that we have little girls growing up like this? How is it that we live in a world where people want this? And how is it that there are people forcing young girls, young boys to do this? Yeah. Those like, things make you, it just like those things make you question humanity. Right. Because yes. you think about, you think about, yes, there, there are the parents or the caregivers who are willing to put them in this space. Right. But then you think about, but in order for them to be able to do that, there has to be a set of people who mm-hmm. want this. Mm-hmm. And you just, it just makes you scratch your head. Like, why? Like, who are you? Like, where did that come from? Where, What is that that will cause you to want to, as you say, devalue the girl child and to to just just take advantage and ravage, you know, a a child's mind and body in that way? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's it's horrible. And and the procurers or the perpetrators, they they're experts at identifying the weaknesses. They're experts at seeing layer upon layer upon layer of vulnerability. I mean, we, we're all vulnerable, okay, to some extent. And we see, we see this happening in the United States, not to the same extent. Do we see devaluation of the girl child like they do in India, like they do in China? Not at all. We, we still have issues here. (laughs) We still aren't getting paid enough. (laughs) We still need, you know, yeah, there is still room for growth, but we don't, we don't apology, we don't apologetically approach someone who finds out they're pregnant with a girl. We don't say, how are you going to get rid of her? No, that's, there is not, we don't, we don't see it at the same level. Mm -hmm. And as far as extreme poverty, we have poverty here. Absolutely. To the extent of some of these places, I, I, I don't think we do. (laughs) And so, here, but in the United States, we deal with a, we deal with other vulnerabilities, and we deal with objectification of women. You know this 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 thought that women are good for one thing that yeah. is perpetrates certain parts of the community. We deal with um, we deal with we're just physically weak. You know, not usually as strong. We deal with insecurity. Hello, how many? How many young girls deal with insecurity? Absolutely yeah. everyone, just to different levels. So if and and lack of support from friends and family yeah. is a huge vulnerability. So you've got the procurers and the perpetrators who 
they see a young lady and they're like, hmm, not a good, not a strong family support system. Hmm, not a lot of friends. Hmm, ooh, dad just lost her job. So finances, you know, like the, the multiple vulnerabilities, like the more vulnerabilities that stack on top, like procurers, perpetrators are experts at identifying that and then taking advantage of it. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's disheartening, it's sickening, it's all of those things. And, you know, it's such a difficult, um, it's a difficult topic right? Talking about human trafficking. And as you say, it's, it's, it's everywhere, right? This is, this is everywhere. And what fascinated me about you is that you, you looked at such a deep, dark underbelly of society and decided, I'm going to do something about this because Mm -hmm. so many of us see things and we're like, oh, that's horrible. Oh, that's really bad. I wish somebody would do something about it. And instead of you being the somebody, we're looking for other people to do something about it. So for you, Don, what was it like, you know, what did you, when did it just come to you that you're like, you know, enough, the somebody who has to do something about this particular thing is me. And that something that I'm going to do is create pants. Now, I don't know how those are connected. <laughs> I don't know how that's connected. Now so that you ask it that way, way, I think maybe I'm crazy. <laughs> No, it's a, it, it is strange. It's a, it's a fun story because it, it was not me. So I will try to do this quickly, but they're like all these little pieces, you know? So while I was living in China, went on a vacation actually with my friend who started the school for street kids, we became very good friends and we went on vacation in, in the United States, when you want to hit a beach, you go to Florida or California. When you live in China and you want to hit a beach for a little rest, you go to Thailand. So we went to Thailand and just got away from our incredibly stressful jobs and a lot of pressure. And I found these really fun pants at the market. And I put these pants on and I was like, I love these pants. And so I had, I think I had one pair of pants. I have a picture of me still. Like I got my hair braided. I was doing the Thailand thing completely. So I get these pants fast forward and I, all this time I'm learning about sex trafficking, right? I come back to the United States. I see this thing in Cambodia and it just weighs on me. I'm like, this is just so horrible. And I just couldn't shake it. I mean, I'd have conversations with people and they would be whining about, oh my gosh, my iPhone doesn't do. And I'm like, this is not a problem. There are little girls. I mean, everything came back to that because I I couldn't, I hadn't figured out how to get involved. And it just, it wasn't me saying, I really need to do this. Everything came back to that. And like what I was learning about sex trafficking and when people would whine about whatever, I'm like, you don't, this is not a problem. You know, let me talk to you about what are some serious problems in this world. So I knew that I had to do something because I couldn't let go of it. And So fast forward a couple of years, I meet this incredibly handsome young man. I married him. We'll do the fast version. (laughs) And while I was with him visiting some friends that were going to be in the wedding, he, we went to a little store and I saw these sandals that were this amazing example of social enterprise. These sandals were made by girls coming out of very vulnerable situations but because of the job that they had and the training that they, they learned while making the sandals, they earned money, which they needed to continue their education. And they had skills and they were learning all sorts of other things. And I was like, wow, business. And it was, it was a, stri- a legit business, like using solid business strategies, but really making a difference in these girls' lives. And I was like, that's cool. I know I had seen other examples, but that's the one who, re- that's the one that really stuck in my head. And then a friend, so my husband ended up buying those sandals for me for the wedding. That's why I have to talk about the wedding because no, they were talk about wedding. it. Listen, I used to be a wedding. I used to own a wedding planning business. Talk about the wedding. Oh, there you go. So little side about my husband. I hinted and hinted and hinted about these sandals. He did not catch it. But his friend did. And so I ended up with the sandals as a wedding gift for my husband because his friend 
caught all the hints. But another friend of mine who came to be in the wedding at the time was teaching in Thailand. And she said, what can I bring for the wedding? You know, what, what do you want? And I was like, you're coming for my wedding. I don't want you to bring me anything. Like, that's enough. That's big. And, but she's British. And I was like, oh, but you're so formal. You're so stinking British. I know you're going to do something, you know. So if you're going to bring me something, bring me some of those Thai pants because I love those pants and I can't find them in the United States. And I wear them, you know, I've got one pair and I'm wearing them all the time. She was like, okay, so two wedding. So this passion, this, this weight of human trafficking, this understanding of social enterprise, and then these amazing pants. So I get several pair for the wedding. The next day, what am I wearing as we leave for our honeymoon? Pants. Of course, I'm wearing my new pants and my sandals. And um, a TSA agent, she's like, oh, I love your pants. Where'd you get those? I'm thinking, when was the last time a TSA agent come? Right. <laughs> yeah, you know? And I said, oh, Thailand. And she's like, oh, those are so cool. And I get on the plane and the flight attendant asks me about my pants. And this was the beginning of a crazy number of strangers asking me about the pants. I go to the hospital, visit a friend. Somebody comes up and says, oh, I love your pants. Where can I get some? And I'm like, Thailand. I do. <laughs> and then it, literally a woman chased me in a parking lot to ask me, those pants look so comfortable. Where can I get your pants? And I was like, Thailand, you know, and so there's this part of me that loves to help people. And there's a part of me that's going, oh my gosh, I want to help people get these really cool pants. And there's this other side of me going, I don't want to sell pants. What are you thinking? Like, I, I just got married. I've already got part, you know, whatever. And, but then the combination of these things, but I was like, Hey, that social enterprise model kept spinning around in my head. And I was like, if there were women coming out of this situation that had jobs by making these pants and these pants were the foundation of a business that could help them, I would sell pants. And so that was how Made for Freedom happened. And we, we started with the pants. I will, I have to say, because this, like I get all sorts of people and they're like, oh my gosh, I want some pants. Well, we don't have any pants. So we had these amazing pants. I partnered, I, my first partner was in Thailand. It was women coming out of these very vulnerable situations. They did an amazing job, made several of our first orders. And then I got this email from the, like the director. And she said, our ladies are getting wonderful opportunities to continue their education and start careers. And I'm like, that's fabulous. That is awesome. And then she continued in the email and we are no longer sewing. I was like, oh, <laughs> stink. You trained them right out of your place. <laughs> I was like, okay, that's great. But we started talking to another center, but in the, like, while we were partnering with them, after we got the pants started, I went on a research trip and I met, I went to a center that's working with survivors coming out of this red light district in India that has over 11,000 women being prostituted out. This center works with ladies coming out of there, teaches them how to read and write, teaches them how to sew, and then gives them jobs so they can support themselves. And they make the most amazing, like organic, softest cotton ever t-shirts. And so we sell their t-shirts. And then I met another group that was making jewelry. And I had another group that heard about Made for Freedom and reached out and said, we're working with survivors coming out of red light districts in this part of the world. Could you, would you please consider using, you know, selling our products as well? So we partner with about 15 centers right now. Wow. So people really, they hear the story of the pants and we have to get the pants back because yes. there's, there's so <laughs> or even some other type of pants. There has to be a pant. Be right. Right. But these pants are so fun. And my, my last trip to India, I, Part, we started talking to a new center. They are providing dignified employment for survivors. Perfect fit. And they're already sewing pants. They're sewing a different style of pant. So they're going to be great. But, you know, the pandemic kind of yeah. took everything for a side road and spin. 
So um, we will get back on the pants, but people get really frustrated because they hear the story about pants and they're like, oh, what's yeah. pants? Um, but and that's where we are. John, I want to do something. I want to break down a little bit about what you're saying because like I've read your story and I've watched stuff on you. So I understand the trajectory of it, but I want people to really get what it is that you did because, and you just mentioned it about this dignified employment mm -hmm. and how you took this, right? These pants and looking at this and you talked about social enterprise and some people may not know what that is. So I want to just go back and really break down what it is that you did, because when you think about the fact that you had this woman say to you, yeah, listen, we're not sewing anymore. Right. And it's not because they don't want to do it, but because you had put something into this world through this social enterprise that allowed them to get back their dignity, right? And to learn skills to now move on that they didn't have to. So like they're going into career. So I don't want that to be lost. So I want us to just break it down a little bit more so that people understand really the impact that you have made and continue to make. Hmm. Well, thank you. It's, um, it's huge. I, you know, that's, I think that's the thing. I talk to people on a regular basis that are like, I want to do something. And I was the same way. And, but it was through these research trips and through hours of research and digging into this. And I'm like, there are so many pieces to the solution. You know, there, there are pieces to prevention. There are pieces to restoration. But a huge one in both of those areas is dignified employment, providing a good job. Like, if you, all those vulnerabilities that I listed off, a lot of those are lessened by dignified employment, you know, extreme poverty. If you, and I say, I say dignified employment, a, a good substitute for that would be good jobs. You know, a lot of people talk about living wage. Living wage is absolutely essential, but sometimes that gets lost in the amount, you know, yeah. and it's more than the amount of money. You can make loads of money by things that are not dignified at all. <laughs> you know, so it's, yeah, true. it's providing dignity. It's providing a good wage. It's providing a safe environment. It's not just an, it's not just an amount of money. It's that it's an amount of money plus mm -hmm. dignity, plus learning, you know, training as you're working so that you're learning more things and you can progress. It's, you know, it's so many things. And the groups that we partner with are also providing all these services that are essential when you've been through a traumatic experience. So providing jobs really kind of like that social enterprise, the sandals, these girls had jobs, they had good jobs that help them move into the future better. And that has, that is kind of, that's our, that is the one thing we point to, you know? Yeah. So when we talk about our impact, we measure, and we're, we're a for-profit. Everybody's like, oh, you're yeah, not. I want to talk to you about that. Cause people think if you, if you're doing good, right. Then, oh my God, you have, you now have to be at a poverty level or you're not making any money. So I really want you to talk about that because when you talk about social enterprise, it doesn't mean that you're not making money or that you can't make money and do good. Right. Right. Exactly. Well, there are, you can also be a for-profit and be living on nothing. <laughs> you know, I mean, let's be part. real. <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, that's the thing. People here I'm a for-profit and they're like, oh, you're just getting rich. I'm like, you have no idea. <laughs> you don't want to look in my pocket. That's a business structure. That's a model. It's a business model. It's a it's for profit a business, model. Right, right. You know, and it's and it has has offered so many more opportunities. They're both, both sides. I went back and forth. We could easily run Made for Freedom as a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. We decided to do for-profit because there are other opportunities over here that I believe will help us scale more significantly. And that that's huge. You can scale as a nonprofit as well. I'm not saying that you can't do one or the other. Like we really could be in either camp. You could run our books through either one. But we chose for profit. I had a lot of, I was seeking advice from a lot of people, but the, um, you can run a for profit and be very missional and be really ethical and 
move forward well? Am I, am I buying my stuff from sweatshops and marking them up in a huge way and making more money? You know, I, I could do, that's a business model. That is a business model that is run all over the place. And I could talk about how much good I'm doing. You know, what I'm doing is paying a whole lot more than sweatshop costs so that the women at the centers that are making the products are not only provided with a really good job, but they're provided with therapy and with counseling and legal services because they need that yeah. when they've come out of these situations. I love that. I, I love when I when I read about you, I was like, I need to have her on the Ladies Who Leverage podcast because I think so many people think that the only way to do good is to have a nonprofit model. And then I want you to talk about Don um, the connections that you're making now because you were saying that because I saw that now you have jewelry and all of that stuff. How is it that you're connecting with those companies and how does that fit into your business model? Because people might be thinking about that too. You know, we start, well, the first, the very first connection, the group that's not working, that's not sewing anymore, that was just sending the most random email I think I've ever sent in my life to a few friends that I lived, that lived in Thailand. And I knew Thailand has, Thailand has some serious issues with trafficking and I had friends there and I thought, I'll reach out. So I sent this email that said something along the lines of, Hi. It's been a while. Do you know anyone working with sex trafficking survivors and teaching them to sew? <laughs> it's like, you might not get an email like this every day, but there you go. Um, so I just reached out randomly to two people. One of them was like, oh, you have to get in touch with this woman. And there was my first center. And I went to visit them. Um, then I was my some of the team reached out and they just kind of did some research and I will find I've seen other brands and they're like, we're partnering with this group that provides jobs for survivors of sex trafficking. And I'm like, huh? So I reach out to the center. I've had groups reach out to me and say, we've heard you tell your story and we, we are, we are completely in line with what you do. Would you consider carrying us? And one time it was a couple of years ago, I think, 2018, I don't know, there was a Forbes, I was in a Forbes article and I was so, I was so excited. I, okay. So I told you my background, like I am not a business. Yeah. I can't say that anymore. I am you a business, business woman. Yes, you but are. That was not the plan. That was not the background. And now I, I'm in Forbes and I was like, okay, I'm so excited. Everybody's going to come and buy and they're going to go to the website and they're going to purchase. I mean, the, the, we got some people coming to the website. More so, I had people around the world reaching out to me going, I'm working with survivors in this part of the world and we make this product. Could you carry our products as well? And it was really assuring. It was really reassuring that there are, there are groups doing really powerful work, helping bring people out of these situations and they desperately need, they need companies like Made for Freedom. You know, so I tell people, like if you boil it down, Made for Freedom is really kind of sales and marketing for all of these groups. Okay. So if you've got a restoration, I call them a restoration center. It's kind of a, the easiest term to, you know, kind of capsulize what they do. But if you've got a group and they are, building relationships with women in red light districts, building relationships with the community and helping these young ladies understand that they are valuable and they have more worth than selling themselves. And you have a safe house where they can come and they can receive the therapy and the counseling and they can receive job training and then they get a job and you have all this stuff. And then you, you're running a, a, a company and you have employees and you got to do inventory and you got to do accounting and you got like, they have their hands full yeah. doing all of this. My, my part of all the pieces is if I can help these groups get to a larger audience, they can create more jobs. That's right. And they can help more women. Right. So that I, and I kind of started, I, who knows, I go all over. Like, sorry. That's all right. But I think I started by saying like what we 
talk about is dignified employment. Yeah. Hours of dignified employment. That's the easiest way to measure it. Like, how do you measure? Oh, that's what that's what got me off the nonprofit. We're a for-profit, but we measure our impact. And our impact is measured by hours of dignified employment. So we're getting, we're about like 25,000 hours of dignified employment for survivors and those coming out of marginalized situations because that is our focus, providing good jobs for those who desperately need it to get them out of vulnerable situations. So if people go to Made for Freedom, go to your website, they will see products from all of these different centers. Is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah. And that's how, and by purchasing those products, they'll be able to give back the money to con- have this continue and help more women, right? It, yeah. It's paying the salaries. It's paying yeah. for the services. It's paying their salaries. But they've already been paid. Mm-hmm. Like I, I buy the products okay. just to get them out, you know, okay. but as soon as I run out, as soon as I'm making sales, I'm ordering more, more. It, okay. It's just creating more jobs because yeah. These centers, I mean, if maybe they're making bags, they they can make a room full of bags, but if no one buys them, they don't make any, they're not creating more jobs, you know, right, the whole idea is just sitting there. Exactly. They have a room full of bags. I come along and I'm like, hey, let me help you sell the room full of bags so that you can keep creating jobs. Yeah. So thinking about it almost like a vendor relationship, like we would purchase products from any other vendor right? So you purchase the products, you put them in your store, you sell them. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're creating this, this outlet for them. Right. Okay. Exactly. Got it. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm sure people are listening and they're like, well, how does that work? And when you just said that about purchasing it, like you purchase it so that you can sell it and then you can buy more. So they're always having to recreate. So it's just like any other type of, for those of you, you know, listening and watching, it's just like any other type of vendor um, relationship that you would have, you know, if you're selling someone else's um, products. Right. But knowing like what we kind of focus on, what we do, we want people to know that if you come to Made for Freedom, that is dignified employment for survival right. and for those that are vulnerable, you know, so it's not, it's not a mixture and it's not, there are a lot of companies that it, I could be selling anything and say, I'm fighting human trafficking. And by saying, I'm giving a percentage back, you know, for example, I bought a scarf one time and I paid more than I would normally pay for a scarf because it money was going to fight breast cancer or the research. It was going to fight the, you know, going to the research to fight breast cancer. And I bought this thing and then I was kind of reading the fine print and it was like 0.05%. And I was like, oh, right. Oh, oh, that part. Oh, not even, not even 0.1%, not even 0.05. I was so hacked. And, and as I learned about the fashion industry, I was like, where did you get this made? Supply chain is huge. If, if we are not providing good jobs to our supply chain, it doesn't matter what we sell. Made for Freedom, we have chosen to go, I, I would say, an incredibly difficult route because we only partner with those who are working with specific people groups, very marginalized or survivors. That's it. We're not, we're not partnering with anyone else. But if you're selling anything and it's made at a sweatshop, paying a poverty wage, leading to generational poverty, you're part of the problem because that poverty, like we talked about, Poverty makes people vulnerable to exploitation. Yeah. So if your company is talking about, oh, we're doing these great things, but you're buying stuff from sweatshops and paying poverty wages, you actually are part of the problem. So don't talk to me about 0.05%. Because, (laughs) right. Yeah. Sorry, my little soapbox. No, no. (laughs) It's an important topic. I mean, I mean, one of the things I'm a professional speaker and I talk about unconscious bias and diversity, and it's the same type of thing that you have people who, oh, you know, oh, I just gave all this money to this organization. But meanwhile, in your own organization, you're not practicing what it is you're quote unquote preaching. So it's the same, you know, it's the same thing. And it's so, 
it's so hard in business today because so many people are, you know, looking at margins and profit and all that stuff. And so, you know, sometimes you just like turn a blind eye to what is really happening and then say, okay, well, the way I'm going to make myself feel better or justify what I'm doing is to say, oh, I gave money over here or I'm doing this. And so there's so much of that happening. And I, you know, it's, it's hard, right? It's a, it's a hard thing to to do, but I love that you have taken on the mantle of this whole concept of dignified employment. And I have a friend who um, is an immigration lawyer and she talked about the reason that she started her immigration practice was because of the way that um, when, her, when her mom came over from Jamaica, how the lawyer treated her with such dignity. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that she started her practice when she started practicing law and immigration practice so that she could help people with this dignified way of becoming, you know, mm -hmm. U.S. citizens. And so um, I, I think people don't don't uh, necessarily understand some people the the I don't know the value, I guess it is of dignity. Mm -hmm. Right. And you know, you saying, listen, it's not just having a job, it's having a good job. It's having a job that pays them well enough so that they can get out of the cycle so that they can, they can remove the vulnerability that exposes them to the trafficking, that exposes them you know, to all of these things that people can, like you said, the procurers and the perpetrators you know, can prey on them. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just think that's so powerful. I'm, I'm so glad that you're that you're doing this. So, what's next for Made for Freedom? Like, what do you what are you planning? Because I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure that brain is moving. So, what is next? <laughs> How did you know? Uh, <laughs> well, you know, so we have we've kind of started this fun little thing. There's a there's a chain of stores across the country that is called Painted Tree. Called what? I'm sorry, Don, Painted. you're getting a little low. Tell me. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Painted Tree. Okay. And they, they basically are these huge stores that build out about 200 booths. So little spaces for small businesses. Okay. And we are, so tomorrow I leave uh, to build out our number six booth in one of these spaces. So this is kind of a big thing for us. In the past six months, we've built out six booths and we are now, Made for Freedom products are physically in the vicinity of like uh, six different communities. You nice. know? So, so it's kind of that, okay, physical presence. It's nice, like if you wanna buy jewelry, it's nice to touch it and to see it. Online is handy and convenient, but Sometimes you just don't, you just want to touch it. <laughs> so, um, so we have, we have kind of branched into this small retail space under a roof with other small businesses, which has been really fun, very taxing and very trying at times, yeah. but, but very good. And now it's more about like the online experience and really helping people. There's, we have these, um, we're, we're building these deep fashion events. So DEEP is an acronym for Dignified Employment Empowers and Protects. So what it looks like is kind of like a home party because I meet people all the time that are like, this is so cool. I want to do more. Like I right. bought my necklace. I love my scarf. I wear my t-shirt all the time, but I want to do more. I want to help people understand this better. And I get it because that's where I was. I wanted to do more and understanding how good jobs really change lives. I put together this whole presentation. It's called the five key components of exploitation. And it's this video series. And I, we're putting together this whole package where people can buy a package and share it with their network and Thanks. share it with their friends and really help under, help help people, help their friends and family understand the issue and understand more about exploitation, the vulnerabilities, the procurers, the perpetrators, all of the parts of exploitation, but also be part of the solution. Because yeah. it's when people really hear 
what trafficking is, what exploitation looks like in our world today, their very next breath is, what can I do? What can I do? And and I wouldn't encourage everyone to start a business like made for it's hard. Yeah, I bet it, it's hard. It is hard, but buying pur- purchasing products, that's something pretty much everyone can do. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna buy a necklace. And so one of my favorite necklaces is this bar, and it has writing on three sides, and it says seek justice, love mercy, walk humbly. You know, I get people that come back and they have had these necklaces and they're like, I wear this all the time. And it reminds me what I need to do. There's a heart one too. I like that heart one. See, and I didn't bring a sample. I'm sorry, but the committed heart necklace. Well, there's a star one as well. So the star is silver and black and the heart is gold and black. So the inside piece of those, the star or the heart is cut out. So that's why you don't see the inside. That piece has been cut out. It's two pieces coming back together, but that heart and star are cut out, made into another necklace. Those necklaces are given to girls still working in red light districts. And they're told, we don't want anything from you, but we want you to know that you're valuable and someone wearing the other part of this is standing for your freedom. Oh my God, don't make me cry. (laughs) (laughs) I love those necklaces. Don't make me cry. Oh my God. This is so awesome. I I I just love this. I, you know, ladies who leverage is a a community of women um, who are female entrepreneurs who are, you know, all about business. And one of the things that I have put into ladies who leverage is about social responsibility. And how, you know, what can we do to make the lives of girls and um, young women better. You know, I, I just think it's so important for, for all of us to pay attention to that. I mean, boys get exploited too, but we know that girls are exploited at a much higher rate and, um, you know, are devalued, as you, as you said, um, disempowered, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so I love that Made for Freedom is doing all of this. And I'm going to definitely be talking to you more to just figure out, you know, what there is and, you know, how we can um, support you in this, because I just think this is so important. Um, I, I just really, I am so appreciative of what you're doing um, to help these young girls. And like you said, you know, showing them that having that peace and giving it to them to let them know that somebody somebody is connected to you, Mm -hmm. right? And somebody is connected to your story. I can't imagine what that does for them. Um, So, (laughs) well, and I've put together, I've put together a page just for people listening that, you know, I have a PDF as well. So it has like three things because that's the big thing is what can I do? Yes. And so I would say, learn, just keep learning, you know, educate yourself about what, what exploitation looks like. And so I have, I've created a free PDF download and that has red flags, risk factors, and action items. It's three, you know, just three columns, pretty simple list, but they're easy to kind of keep in front of mind yeah. so that if you see it happening or so that you're aware. And then the second one is just get involved, you know, buy something so that you're, you know, that you're helping provide jobs or do a deep fashion event, you know, do something bigger with like your friends and go, okay, we're going to all sit down and we're going to learn about this because we need to learn about this, you know, and share the information. So if anyway, I'll give you the link and yes, please. I was just going to ask you if people want to contact you, want to learn more, want to, you know, support you, how can they reach out to you? So one way, the easiest way is probably madeforfreedom.com. You can reach me at Dawn at madeforfreedom.com, my email. Um, And there's a contact page on the website as well. But there are the deep fashion events. And if you happen to live, see, oh, where are we? Kansas City, if you live in Kansas City, Bloomingdale, Illinois, Naperville, Illinois, Roswell, Georgia, St. Louis, Baldwin, and I'm sure there's, there's one other place, I don't know. But there's a list of shop in person. Okay. So if you wanted to actually go to a little place, if you happen to be in one of those cities, that would be awesome. Yeah. And we'll put all the um, information to, that you can connect with Dawn and Made for Freedom. It will all be in the show notes. So just make sure that you click. Um, 
you know, this is something that we can all do to do our part. Sometimes we're not really sure we want to do something, but you know, we're not, not everybody's going to make, develop some pants <laughs> and create a made for freedom, but you can do your part by purchasing some of the items um, that made for freedom has on their website, because all of that, you know, that goes back to helping these women and these young girls have this dignified employment and become empowered women in the world so that they cannot, they can no longer be devalued and disempowered by these procurers and mm. perpetrators. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So Don, thank you so much for taking the time to come on and share this really important information with us. You know, and as I said at the beginning, people will probably think, well, why are you talking about trafficking? And it's not just about the trafficking. It's about how we can do good in our businesses, um, do well in our businesses and also do good, right? And so that's a whole concept of having like a social enterprise. So for many of you out there who are listening and watching, think about how you can also do good, right? Whether you have a for-profit business or a nonprofit, how can you do good? What is something that you can do? It might be supporting somebody like Dawn, or it might be taking on a whole enterprise like Dawn has, but whatever it is, we can all do well and do good. And that's something that I heard from um, uh, Barry Baumgartner, who talks about this all the time, you know, talking about the, the one of the reasons that she does what she does is so that she can do well. So, and be, by doing well, you can do good. So mm -hmm. again, thank you so much, Dawn, for being on the Ladies Who Leverage podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It has been a delight. Thank you. Thank you. And for all of you, please make sure that you are subscribed to the Ladies Who Leverage podcast so you never miss an episode. Our episodes drop Monday mornings at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And Ladies Who Leverage is not just a podcast. We are a phenomenal global community. We create safe and supportive ecosystems for women to connect authentically, build strategically and live life unapologetically AF. And so if you are a female entrepreneur who is looking for a community just like that, I need you to go to lwlcollab.com. Now our community is application and invite only. We wanna make sure that we have the right women in that space. So go to lwlcollab.com. If you meet the requirements, apply so that we can have a conversation and you can join us so that you too can connect authentically, build strategically and live life unapologetically AF. And until then, take care. Thank you for joining us. This podcast has been brought to you by Lady Lawyer Media. Make sure that you subscribe so that you never miss an episode. And if you are a female entrepreneur or business owner, and you're looking for a safe, supportive ecosystem to create and share ideas and information, build a thriving business, and live life unapologetically AF, then I'd invite you to apply to Lady Who Leverage. We're an exclusive community of badass female entrepreneurs. So if that sounds like you, go to www.lwlcollab.com. That's L-W-L-C-O-L-L-A-B as in boy, dot com, so that you can apply to join us in our amazing badass network. And until then, I want you to unleash your badassery and live life unapologetically AF.